Psalm 148, selected verses. Praise the Lord. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you highest heavens and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind, fulfilling his command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. We in the church have a tendency to think of ourselves as the main source of praise and worship that God receives. But in truth, all of our praise makes up only a tiny fraction of the total. Just think about it. Even though it is far beyond our senses, every single rock, tree, bird, fish, blade of grass and stick is singing praises to God. It boggles the mind, doesn't it? What an incredible chorus of praise that must be to hear, if only we had the ears of God. I like to think of the world's creatures like an orchestra. Each type or species is like a different instrument, all adding to the song of praise that rises up to God. Of course, the praise of God's creatures is not actually in the form of a song. Animals praise God by existing, by being true to their own design and nature. So a beaver building a dam is praising God, but so is a wolf pack hunting for a deer or a plant growing towards the sunlight. This metaphor also highlights that we need all of Earth's creatures to create a song of praise that is worthy of God. And every instrument that we remove from the orchestra impoverish, impoverishes the world and our praise of God. If God had wanted to receive only human praise, God could have chosen to create only us. God did not. If God had changed God's mind, God could have arranged to save only Noah from the flood. God did not. Clearly, God cares about all creatures. In fact, God clearly loves diversity, to such an extent that some have joked that given the abundance of beetle species on the earth, God must be particularly fond of them. After all, surely one or two species of beetle should have been enough for God? Even 10? Why do we need something like 400,000 species? That's 30% of all the animals that we know of in the whole world. And yet, for whatever reason, God felt that creation was not complete without each of the 400,000 plus species. When God placed us in the garden with all of this abundance, it was as wise stewards, not as wasteful and despotic overlords, even if we don't always live up to that calling. And we humans do have a poor record of looking after other species, especially here in Australia, where we have the highest rate of mammal extinction in the entire world. How do you think God feels about this? I think it makes God weep. That it is not only animals and people, but also God who suffers from the harm that we bring to God's creatures. Every time we wipe out a species, we are removing a unique song or vocal range, kind of like a soprano or an alto in a choir, from God's orchestra. In doing so, we are making God's song of creation poorer, less complex and less diverse. Can we, as followers of the Creator God, claim to have this right? After all, we believe in a great and almighty God, all loving, all powerful, all present, all knowing, a God worthy of praise, right? Indeed, a God not only worthy of praise, but a God worthy of as much praise as possible, of all praise. So when I look around and see the destruction that we have wrought upon the planet and its creatures, I have to ask, do these actions speak of the love that we claim to have for God? Thinking about this has led me to a new understanding of what I think it means for us to be truly faithful disciples of Jesus within our time, the Anthropocene, a period of ecological destruction 
and extinction rates a thousand times higher than natural. And I think that true discipleship in this time means pursuing sustainability and caring for God's creation with all our hearts. Not as some optional extra, not as something we talk about just occasionally, but something that should be part of our DNA as Christians, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Environmental actions in the church have indeed been bubbling up all around the world, and I can see the movement of the Holy Spirit in this, with a challenge for the Christian church to take up the mantle of caring for each and every creature, to love them because God loves them, and to show our love for God in doing so. Imagine the witness that this could be to our world. What if, instead of Jesus' bumper stickers on our cars, we proclaimed our faith to others by saving water, travelling on public transport even when it's inconvenient, helping with conservation projects for endangered species, and working continually to reduce our waste as much as possible? What if our uniforms as Christians became overalls, hiking boots, and gardening gloves? If our bookstores became full of eco-literature and eco-products, and we shared skills, books, tools, fruit and veg from our garden with our church each week. What if we could look at the most dedicated environmentalists in the whole world and know that they must be Christians, that their love of God must be what inspires them to such faithfulness, such discipleship? Wouldn't that be something exciting? Something people would want to be part of? So let's all work to protect God's orchestra with passion and joy. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.